Good morning, it's John Williams here at MIT, and I'd like to thank you for inviting me this morning to present to eLearning Forum Asia 2017. And I'd particularly like to thank uh, Professors Kevin Chan, Chetwin Chan, and Henry Chan for inviting me. Uh, they sound like the Three Musketeers, don't they? But I'd like to ask a serious question this morning. Can we develop a science of education? Before that, I'd just like to introduce myself and my collaborator, Dr. Abel Sanchez. Uh, we both teach introductory courses to computing at MIT. So we're very much into teaching software, and this has had quite a considerable impact on education, and we believe it's going to have an even bigger impact. In my previous life, I was director of the Internet of Things laboratory at MIT. It's called the Auto ID Lab. Uh, automatic identification. Education hasn't changed much in the last thousand years. Here we have University of Bologna, 1088, and here are the students. We've got a long way to go. What's happened in uh, the last 15 years since the uh, internet started and we developed the web is that we've got massive stores now of content. So, for example, the Internet uh, has four billion times the amount of information that the Library of Congress has collected. We've got learning management systems, and I'll come back and talk a bit about those because I think they're uh, somewhat antiquated. And we've got at MIT the open courseware movement, which put a lot of content on the web. And now uh, we have a lot of competition in that many other universities are putting their content on the web. So not all the best uh, content is coming from MIT. Uh, it's good content, we think, but in many cases we don't know because we have no metrics. And I'll talk about uh, how we introduce metrics into education in a moment. So we've recently, uh, well, about uh, two years ago now, launched edX. Uh, which is the follow-up to OpenCourseWare. And these courses uh, are online and are classified as MOOCs, massive online courses, uh, where we have in some courses 20,000 students. Um, I think the record at the moment is a course, uh, not in edX actually, uh, in Coursera, that has over a million people that have taken it. So these courses have tremendous reach. And we have small private online courses where we're collaborating with various universities to present various learning materials. And we've moved, certainly in uh, the course that uh, Abel Sanchez and I teach, to active learning, where we lecture for, say, five minutes, and then we have a 20-minute exercise where the students get hand-on experience. At MIT, we've launched a MicroMaster, and this is really um, a different way in which to admit people or to filter people into MIT. Few get in because we have limited spaces, and so somewhere around one in 10 are admitted to MIT. So here we have the historical admissions model, which many apply and few get in. The MicroMasters is somewhat different, where everyone uh, is allowed to take the online course, and then the high performers via the examination are admitted. And so this is a very different admissions model. This is open access, if you like. Performance on MIT coursework determines success. And of course, the marketplace uh, is not limited to MIT uh, ventures. We've got Udemy, and we've got Udacity, and we've got the boot camps. And these are responding, I think, to the needs of industry. To some extent, there are many tools now that workers need to understand in order to perform their tasks. So these boot camps claim that they can cover four years of material, say, in computer science in roughly a term. So what we're trying to do is to look at the claims that a course is good or not by having it produce data. So if we can collect enough data, we can actually test whether, say, the teacher is good or the content is good. What we found in MIT, uh, this is uh, Professor Pritchard, course 8.01, uh, 
he looked at the final exam and at the scatter in the setting of those exams in the sense that he took the even problems and then the odd problems and plotted them and found out that the line it should be a straight line you wouldn't expect people to score better on say even problems or better on odd problems they should lie along a straight line and they don't and so it means that the exams that we're setting traditionally in our courses may not be robust in the sense that if we gave the exam again we might have different students passing or failing the error if you like in our exams at the moment or in some of our exams at the moment may be as high as 25 percent that we're misclassifying people he found that a cyber tutor so this was a piece of software that the students interacted with throughout the term actually produced a more accurate metric of the students performance so this is rather worrying if our metrics at the moment uh, are not that good so recently uh, we've joined in a team uh, that's led by HKUST. We have Polly Yu, Professors uh, Chetwin Chan and Henry Chan uh, collaborating. And at MIT uh, we've got a team that includes Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Uh, Richard Larson. And so what we're trying to do is to collect data continuously on a course to develop a 360 degree view of education. Now, if the students interact or get the material through a web server and view it through a browser, then we can record all their interactions. We can watch their mouse movements, their key clicks. And if we're clever, we should be able to produce metrics on how good the content is, how good uh, the teachers are, how good the TAs are, etc. And if we do A-B testing, so this is used widely in industry now, for example, to test the effectiveness of a web page. They don't believe the designers of the web page, so they put the various elements of the web page in uh, different places, in different uh, combinations, and they look at the effectiveness of that web page. So the one that produces the most uh, dollars usually, uh, for example, is the most effective. And so if we've got large enough basis of people so, for example, in a MOOC with 20,000 people, we can have quite accurate statistics uh, doing A-B testing, having 10,000 of the students take uh, one version of the content and the other 10,000 take another version of the content. And we can do various combinations of that. But A-B testing is very effective in actually sorting out whether content is effective or not. We believe that we should be able to gather data continuously on a course to develop a picture of the performance of the teacher, of the student, and of the content. And we'd like to get a 360 degree view of the student. Normally in a course, we don't get that. We don't know what other courses the student is taking. We don't know how they're doing in those courses until uh, the end of term, or at least until a significant way through that other course. We'd like to improve that. For example, we'd like to have predictive modeling so that we can find out which students need help and intervene, provide them help much earlier than we do now. It would be great if we could predict the performance on the first day of the class. Perhaps we give a, a small test. We'd like to help particularly the lower performing students. Today, uh, one of the issues for us in MIT is that the students come into a course uh, without a standardized background. They've taken different preparatory courses and often they're lacking certain skills that are needed for the course. So we need to take remedial action at the beginning of the course to bring them up to standard. And this requires quite a number of resources that often we don't have. We'd also like to customize the course so we can challenge high achievers. And we'd like to explore different pathways to graduation, uh, especially for industry today. We'd also like to be able to understand the stresses on a student, so understand uh, student wellness, if you will, that uh, many students are under considerable stress that we're unaware of until perhaps it's uh, uh, too late. I mentioned edX, and we're in the era of big data that certainly 
uh, the large uh, MOOCs can collect and they're asking questions such as what's the best speaking speed for our presentation? Is it 120 words per minute, 150, 180? What do you think? Is it, is it 120 that speaking more slowly and clearly is better? Or is it better to speak quickly? Turns out the students learn better at 180 words per minute. So talking quickly seems to be better than talking slowly. How long should you talk for? Turns out students get bored quite quickly. Uh, the ideal is somewhere between eight and 15 minutes, but it's certainly uh, fairly short. And we're trying to address that by moving to active learning where we do quite short presentations. Students prefer hand diagrams to PowerPoint. We sometimes talk about death by PowerPoint. Certainly in industry, that's the case. Uh, but the standard in academia at the moment certainly is uh, PowerPoint or the equivalent. Now, on the other hand, the future of work is changing. Here's the uh, famous Gartner hype cycle. And you see already augmented reality is on the down curve, but we've got virtual reality over here. And it's clear that we're not taking advantage of those. The nature of work itself is changing. Here's a typical factory. Uh, you can see there's one or two people, but in general, automation is having a huge impact on industry. Machine learning is spinning up now, and that too will have a large impact, replacing many jobs that are done by humans by machines. And this is a, we believe, a serious social issue that we need to address. So the landscape for education is changing fast. There's video content explosion on the web. There are multiple versions of say a course in mechanics or a course in machine learning. And which is the most effective for education, we have yet to determine. There are many educational technology players that are not universities. So we have Coursera, Nudacity, for example, Khan Academy, and many others entering the educational space. Google, for example, has its own platform and content. Amazon is doing the same. This is LMS 365 by Microsoft. Investment in education is growing. Education is becoming key because technology is changing very quickly. We need to not only educate our young people, but we need to re-educate our mid-career managers. Augmented reality, for example, holds great potential. Microsoft HoloLens. Now, there are literally hundreds of tools that you might choose from to help you teach a course. These are just some of them. But at the moment, the platforms are rolling their own tools, if you like. They're not allowing you to pick and choose between these tools. So we believe that a plugin architecture for an educational platform is required. So by this, we mean that you should be able to plug in any of those hundreds of apps that may help you, for example, master a quiz. There's Quizmaker, iQuiz, many, many others that will help you with quizzes. With video content, there's YouTube, Vimeo. Again, many other content servers out there that you might choose to serve content from. Now, what we believe is that if this is channeled into a web page via a web server, then even though you may not be the owner of the YouTube content, you can actually monitor the student's interaction with it. So for example, you can know whether the student is clicking or is skipping through the video or replaying parts of that video. So we believe that there's space for a very different kind of content management system, which in fact is more like Uber, that it doesn't own any content. So like Uber doesn't own cars, this architecture means that you needn't actually own the content at all, but you can monitor the students and their interaction with it. So in closing, there's a content explosion. Much of the content is already available by YouTube or TEDx or any of these people that are streaming content. There are changing models of education available. So flipped classroom, active learning, for example. Uh, there are high investments in educational technology. There are web platforms opportunities that I've just hinted at. We can apply data science to education. And if we do that, if we collect data, 
then we can turn education for the first time into a science. We can tell if teachers are good, we can tell if content is good uh, by applying these metrics. And so we believe there's a new generation of educational technology to support instruction, collaboration and research and that we need to move rapidly in the universities uh, towards that. So thank you very much indeed and I'll be happy to take questions.